Hey guys, Pastor Ben here with another review and reflection. Today I want to talk about this little book, Leisure, the Basis of Culture, written by the uh, German uh, Catholic philosopher Joseph Pieper. Um, this is a little book, like I said, about 140, 150 pages, and it contains two essays or addresses that uh, Pieper gave uh, in Germany in 1947. And so it's a book that um, has been around for um, quite a long time. It's amazing to think that it's, you know, we're going on almost a century at this point, 75, 80 years, and has really stood the test of time as a philosophical work that has a lot to say to our contemporary uh, culture and situation. If you're in uh, involved in kind of classical uh, education circles, this is maybe a book that you've come across or have heard. I've heard about this book for many, many years, and a very kind uh, woman in our congregation gave me a copy of it. She had read it recently and really enjoyed it, and so she got me a copy that I could enjoy for myself and uh, was able to read it um, recently and wanted to share a few thoughts. So first off, as I said, this book actually contains two different works. The first uh, essay or address is Leisure, the Basis of Culture, and the second one is The Philosophical Act. Each of them is about 70 or 80 pages long and um, very good read. Each of them stands on their own, but they also really work well together. Pieper said he wrote both of them kind of in the same summer and uh, gave the addresses in Germany around the same time. So they're a natural pairing together and are really together kind of building up this project of what Pieper wants to communicate about leisure and culture and all of that. Now, to understand what he's getting at, there's a couple of things that are helpful to know. First is where uh, Pieper, Joseph Pieper is coming from as uh, a writer and as a thinker. Like I said, he was a German philosopher, uh, Roman Catholic uh, tradition, very much grounded in ancient and medieval philosophy and the theology of Christian thought that would develop um, out of that and alongside that and in conversation and critique of those things as well. And so he is writing as very much a Christian, an intellectual, a philosopher, and a theologian. But he's also writing, not in an ivory tower, but um, literally in the rubble of post-World War II Germany. Again, these addresses were given in 1947. And he's talking to a world where Germany, his country, is divided now. There's a, you know, between East and West, all of Germany is dealing with um, the economic effects of having lost two world wars in a generation or two, of um, having just walked through all of the atrocities and, and terrors of World War II, the Holocaust, Hitler. And this is something that people would know something about. He was actually, early on in the 30s, he saw Hitler as maybe someone who uh, could bring a positive change uh, for Germany, and he had written some things in support of him. As Hitler's reign went on, he very vehemently renounced that and saw that there was a kind of idolatry there. And of course, later, people came to see all that Hitler had actually done and the horrors he had committed. And so Pieper is writing in that kind of a mixed context. You know, the culture is in turmoil, politics is in shambles, the economy is broken, the national pride and spirit is destroyed. And literally, as you're walking through the streets, you're seeing the great task before us is the task of how do we rebuild Germany? And that, and Germany is maybe kind of the epicenter of what the Western world as a whole was feeling is, how do we get back from this? How do we rebuild? What does it look like to move forward? And it's really that crisis, that question, that's prompting Joseph Pieper to write these essays and give these addresses. And the answer he gives is maybe the last thing you would expect. Uh, again, there's very real problems, social problems, political problems, economic problems. But what Pieper calls us to is to go back to um, ancient voices and ancient sources and ancient disciplines of philosophy and theology. Now, some of you already may be kind of switching off in your head and thinking this is exactly what kind of ivory tower eggheads do. They're not in touch with the real challenges of the real world, and they just try to kind of, you know, fall into this escapism of intellectual pursuits, ignoring the real challenges that people face. But if that's your response, I would really encourage you to um, give people a hearing because 
he has a lot to say and he 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 does it in a way that shows you he's he's aware of the real challenges of the real world and he's not falling into a kind of gnosticism that says well the body the economy politics all of these things are beneath us we just need to transcend and jump to these intellectual spheres no he's writing as a christian and christianity always is incarnated and embodied in the real world in real people's lives and is very concerned with the physical with the economic with the political all of these things it sees that wrapped up in and connected to the spiritual but what peeper does is to help us in our maybe materialist mind that's very pragmatic very results oriented to recognize that um while economics is important politics is important all of these things are important and they have their place ultimately uh, a healthy economy healthy politics healthy community life is going to be the fruit of something that's more basic than that and the the thing that uh peeper points us to in his first essay is leisure you know he has his thesis right here in the title leisure is the basis of culture. So he says, if you want to think about how do we rebuild our culture, how do we rebuild our society? He says, leisure has to be the basis of that. Now, right up front, we need some definition, right? Um, what does Peeper mean by leisure? He, he goes into quite a bit of detail describing what this means and what it doesn't mean. So I'll just give a short summary here, and I'm really just inviting you to, to grapple with, with his essays. But by leisure, Peeper does not mean free time. You know, when we talk about leisure, that's usually what we mean. Leisure is I've put in my hours at the factory or at my desk and I can go home, I can sit on the couch and I can have some leisure. You know, I can watch a movie, I can read some books, I can play a video game, I can, you know, pursue a hobby. But, you know, that's kind of what I do in my downtime. That's leisure. And uh, if that's how we're thinking of leisure, that's definitely not what Peeper has in mind or what's going to form the basis of culture. What Peeper has in mind is something more akin to the ancient idea of leisure. And you can see this in the way that the ancients, especially the ancient Greeks, would talk about um, the different aspects of knowledge and of education. They would talk about um, education in terms of the servile arts and the liberal arts, right? So things literally that were suitable for slaves to learn, things that were suitable for free men to learn. And of course, you can tell there's a kind of class approach to this and that is going to be challenged by Christianity later on. Um, but uh, there's something that they're getting at that's worth grasping, that there's certain kinds of knowledge that really exist as a means to an end, right? We learn how to do a certain job so that um, we can accomplish a certain goal. Right. And this is not just talking about blue collar, white collar work. That's not really the division. You could be a surgeon. Right. Who is very educated, very knowledgeable. You're doing very challenging, you know, kind of white collar work. And you're still basically working in this realm of what you're doing is a means to another end, promoting physical health. Or maybe you're a banker, you know, um, stimulating the economy. Maybe you're a plumber, you know, fixing the plumbing, right? All sorts of occupations and vocations would fall into this category. In fact, the bulk of human life falls into that. And Pieper says, that's not a bad thing. Again, the Greeks kind of had this uh, latent, you know, dualism and, you know, anti-materialism. And it's all about the spiritual. And so they tended to downplay that. Christianity comes along and says, God became man. And that God-man worked as a construction worker, as a carpenter, right? So Christianity doesn't have any time of day for a kind of uh, class, you know, anti-blue collar, you know, um, ethos. However, what it does is to sanctify the distinction that the Greeks were making. The Greeks recognized a lot of our endeavors fall into this servile sphere where we're, we're learning things, it engages us, but we're doing these things as means to an end. But there are certain spheres that exist as ends in and of themselves. And for the Greeks, the, the, the thing that they would put in that place, first and foremost, is philosophy, right? The study and love of wisdom. Christianity would come along and say philosophy is, is part of it, but even beyond that is theology itself, the knowledge and love of God. That these are things that exist as an end in themselves. That doesn't mean that they don't have practical implications, it doesn't mean they don't feed into those other things that we do. They do. They're formative. They shape us. In fact, that's part of what Peeper wants to argue, is that those things... And sorry, I should have connected a dot here. I'm jumping ahead. Forgive me. So um, 
when 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 Pieper thinks about leisure, he's going back to that Greek idea, which says leisure is um, the the things that free men study or do. So philosophy, they would include theology in a certain form that's going to become sanctified again uh, when Christianity comes into conversation with these things. But but that's what the Greek idea was. It was that you know you have slaves who do this kind of work who do the the, the 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 means to an end kind of work to kind of let life happen, but really what we're made for, what we want to pursue, and what free men should give themselves to is not just building up their wealth or enjoying the games or having big houses or you know whatever, but the pursuit of of wisdom and of philosophy and and engaging these things, and that's what Pieper has a view. He says those disciplines, those things, those ways of interacting with the world that don't just reduce us into um into you know cogs in a machine or means to an end these are things that exist as ends in themselves that's ultimately what forms the basis of culture engaging in those things pursuing those things having a sensitivity to those things is what will produce and stimulate the growth or regrowth of a culture so leisure in that sense philosophy and theology forms the basis of culture. And Pieper goes on to develop this in a number of ways. He has a critique of kind of our modern way of life, which wants to bring everything into the sphere of work and productivity. Everything takes on the language of the factory, for example. And even our engaging in philosophy and theology can often be reduced to how it advances certain ends. And this is something where um, I found this helpful you know, as a Christian and as a pastor, because one of the things that I labor to do by God's grace is to take the theology and wisdom of the scriptures and to help us see how it applies to daily life. And that's a very biblical thing, right? Think about Paul's letter to the Ephesians, where he spends three chapters, you know, the whole book is six chapters. He spends the first three chapters just glorying in the truth of the gospel, the riches and depths of theology, the beauty of the wisdom and knowledge and power of God. And it's this exaltation, it's this glory, it's this wonder, it's amazing. And then he goes for three more chapters into detailed uh, imperatives. Here's how that should affect the way you live as Christians. Here's how it should affect the way you live as Christians in community. Here's how it should affect the way you live as Christians in the world, in your workplace, in your marriage, uh, with your kids, you know, all of these kinds of things. That's the Christian approach, right? So theology to life is a natural move. However, what we have to guard against is thinking that theology only matters or really only is worth studying if it provides fuel for my life. And this is something that I think as American Christians in particular, we're very prone to, right? How many people will flock to a class on parenting? Because it's something that's taking the gospel and applying it to their lives. But then they'll kind of, uh, you know, uh, ignore something that just says, let's talk about the doctrine of God. Who is God? Let's talk about the doctrine of the Trinity. Let's talk about uh, the relationship between the Father and the Son, right? These things we go, well, unless you can tell me how it's going to apply to my life, how it's going to make me a better husband, a better father, a better citizen, a better businessman, a better whatever, um, then we're not really engaged. And there's something flawed there, right? If one... uh, One side of the pendulum would be to say, you know, theology has nothing to say to life. Uh, The other side, which maybe we fall into more just in our culture in general, is to say, unless this theology directly shapes my life, it gives me an application, something to do, then it's not really relevant. And part of what the Christian view says, and this is something that Pieper draws out so helpfully, is that while theology has infinite implications and applications for life, Right. In fact, as he's saying, this is really the basis of culture. Everything else flows from it. So if you want those things, you have to have this. And yet you can't ever reduce this, the philosophy, the theology, to merely the fuel or the raw material to do what you really want. That would be to turn it into a means to an end rather than an end in itself. And that's something that really uh, he fleshes out in his second essay, The Philosophical Act. He goes on to talk about how do you do philosophy? What's the relationship of philosophy and theology? and a whole bunch of other things. So I won't even try to retrace the steps of uh, each of these essays. They're very tightly argued, very carefully articulated. Um, He is an academic. 
he's writing that way. So if you're not used to reading philosophy, it could be a bit of a stretch for you, but he's a good writer. It's worth wrestling with. It's worth engaging with. It's worth charting the distinctions that he makes. And I think uh, a disciplined reader will find a lot there that's helpful. But I think what stood out to me was just clarifying and kind of recentering the role of, of theology for not only the Christian life, but for all of life. And to help clarify that role, that it is, in a sense, the root of everything else in life. And yet, we don't just go to theology to get us further down the track in other areas. Uh, it's also the fruit that we have, right? It's kind of the end that we pursue. And that as we do theology, as we engage with the scriptures, our posture should not just be one of like a, a workman that's kind of rustling through the pages of scripture to find tools to do other things, but that part of our basic posture as Christians is, is to just receive and revel in um, what God has done and what he's revealed. I'm, I'm working on a sermon right now for this Sunday, and it's the text is Ephesians 3, 14 through 21, which is Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church. And he's talking about what it means to be faithful, what it means to be fruitful, but there's no commands. He's not telling us to do anything. And again, that's not because Christianity isn't practical. Beginning in chapter four, right after this prayer, he's going to get into the practical. He's going to get into the nitty gritty. But before he does that, he wants us to recognize that part of what it means to be a Christian, part of what it means to be the church, part of what it means to be human fundamentally, right? Redeemed and reconciled in Christ is that we receive what God has done. There's this posture of openness to God and the world that is fundamental to what it means to be human. And if we upend that and try to put ourselves in the place of being the master and controller of fate, we'll end up creating the kind of dystopian world that Hitler created. And that's kind of Peter's critique is that um, if we want to move past the horrors of the 20th century, we don't get there by just more economic planning, more political engagement, more nationalist zeal. That's what got us in this mess in the first place. What orients us to something better and deeper is rooting ourselves once again in what it means to be human and in what it means to be redeemed by God, by our triune God. And so that's really where where Pieper ultimately goes uh, in his book. And it's something that um, is worth wrestling with, is worth grappling with, and I think can help us to know what it means uh, to, to, to pursue God and to see what fruit that will produce. So I would highly recommend, uh, if you're interested in these things at all, to spend some time with Joseph Pieper's essays, Leisure, the Basis of Culture, and The Philosophical Act.